to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The apostle Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. In this series of lessons, we have stressed the essentiality of baptism. But today we want to take a slightly different approach. Today we ask the question, What will baptism not do? Hope you'll get your Bible and stay tuned with us as we consider this subject together. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855. 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. The Scripture teaches that when by faith, one repents of his sins and confesses Jesus as the Son of God, that he is baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, and that all past sins of that person have been forgiven. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, baptism is for the remission of sins. Acts 22, 16, Saul was told to arise and be baptized and have his sins washed away. And so there's no doubt baptism will Forgive a person of past sins. The Bible teaches that baptism will add someone to the Lord's church. Acts 2 verse 47 teaches those who gladly received His word and were baptized, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. By one spirit were all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. The scriptures teach that baptism will put a person into Christ. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 and Galatians chapter 3 verse 27. As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. And friend, the scriptures clearly teach that a person is saved, that it will save a person, baptism will save a person from sin. Baptism does now also save us. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse number 21. But today we want to consider what are some things baptism will not do. Friend, let's realize first of all that baptism in and of itself cannot save a person who doesn't believe and won't repent. Friend, we want to stress that we're not saying baptism is some magical, mysterious act that in and of itself removes sin. We're not saying there's something magical in the water, that there's some potion or that baptism is some magical talisman that you can just run to when things happen. That's not the idea. Baptism alone will not save someone who's not willing to believe 
and repent. Let's say that somebody comes in off the street and they say, we realize this is the church here and we heard that you baptized folks. We say, yeah, that's right. We, we, we love to baptize people for the remission of sins. And they say, well, we don't really know much about the Bible and we really don't know much about Christ, but we think we better get baptized anyway. We're going to baptize that person. We're going to say to them, do you believe? And they say, believe in what? We're going to say to them, are you willing to repent? And they say, what's that mean? Are you going to just take them and baptize them in hopes that it might work? Of course not. Baptism without belief, confession, and repentance preceding it will not save a person. We don't believe nor do we teach there's anything mystical or magical in the water. If the salvation was in the water, friend, I'd never get out of it, would you? I want to make sure that somehow I stayed in the water of baptism until the Lord came. If that's where the salvation, if it's something mystical or magical in the water, but that's not the case. For a baptism to be effective as God planned, it must be preceded by belief and confession and repentance. Must a person believe in Christ to be baptized? Absolutely. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Now, think about this example with me. Do you remember the Ethiopian eunuch? In Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling in his chariot down the road back as he's going back to Ethiopia, and he's been teaching about Christ. And somehow he gets to the point of how to get into Christ through baptism, and the Ethiopian eunuch in the distance says, Look, here's water. What hinders me? Here was the hindrance. If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 38. Well, what about repentance? Is repentance also essential uh, to be saved, and does it precede baptism? Absolutely. In Luke chapter 3, certain Jewish elite, uh, they came out to Jesus and, and they said to the, or they came out to be baptized by John, and the reason is just because everybody else is doing it. And so John said to them in Luke 3 verses 5 through 8, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruits worthy of of repentance. These people want to be baptized because everybody else was doing it, but they hadn't repented. What did John say? Nope, I'm not baptizing you until you prove by your actions, until you stop living a life of sin and bring forth fruits of repentance, it would do you no good to be baptized. And so baptism alone will not do anything. It must be preceded by belief in Christ. It must be preceded by repentance, a desire to change one's life, and it must be preceded by confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, let's think about some other things that baptism will not do. Friend, let's also realize that baptism in and of itself, uh, baptism will not remove the physical consequences of sin. I want you to think about this for just a moment. The Bible teaches, no doubt, David committed a, a great sin against God when he sinned with Bathsheba. And David was forgiven of that sin. Psalm 32, verse 5, uh, 2 Samuel 12, verses 9 through 14, of his uh, adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, the Scripture teaches God washed him thoroughly of his sin. He was cleansed of that sin. But did... David being forgiven mean that there were no longer any consequences, physical consequences of that sin? Friend, such is not the case. David faced the death of his son. That young son who came from that adulterous relationship, he died. Uh, Ammon and Tamar, you've got David's son Amnon, and then you've got the events with Tamar and the, and the war and the strife that occurred, and that occurred because of what David did. Were there physical consequences, uh, strife between him and his son Amnon and, and between Tamar? Absolutely. Was there problems with Absalom because of that? Absalom eventually murders Amnon, his son, and flees. A lot of that goes right back to David's sin, as the Scripture will point out. You've got the treason of Absalom. You've got the death and the defeat of Absalom. And so you've got the death of one son. You've got the death of his older son. You've got problems with Amnon and Tamar. And a lot of that stemming directly from a physical consequence of David's sin. Friend, baptism, listen carefully, 
Does the Bible teach that baptism washes away the spiritual consequences of sin? Absolutely. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. If one obeys the gospel, becomes a Christian, and his sins are washed away, spiritually speaking, he's been made clean again. He can walk in newness of life, Romans 6 verse 4. He's a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5 17, spiritually. But baptism is not going to remove every physical consequence of sin. Now, let me give you some illustrations. Let's say that a person is a uh, murderer. Let's say they've committed murder. Let's say they've committed some heinous murder. And let's say after they commit that, that they realize, I've sinned, I've done wrong. They want to obey the gospel, become a Christian. Somebody teaches them the gospel and they learn about Christ. All their, even the sin of murder, all their sins are forgiven that they've repented of. They're baptized for the remission of their sins. The moment they're baptized, does the jail cell open and do they walk out? Well, not quite. They'll still have to suffer the physical consequences and serve their sentence for that very well. What about another example? Think about this with me as we think about someone suffering the physical consequences. Let's say that in one's previous life, someone had subjected their body to drug use over and over again. And finally, they reach a low point and they realize this is wrong. I need Christ. I need to learn the Bible. I need to go to heaven. And they change their life. They repent. They leave that life of, of drug abuse behind. They obey the gospel and become a Christian. Have all their past sins been washed away? Absolutely. Spiritual consequences have been negated of sin by the blood of Jesus. Does that mean now that their body's 100%? They don't have any effects of drug abuse? Well, of course not. They may have liver problems. They may, they're going to still have to deal with that uh, dependency that their body had upon that. They're going to have to resist that. There may be other physical consequences to go along with that. Baptism does not remove the physical consequences that we may have subjected ourselves to in a life of sin. Does it remove sin? Absolutely. But there may be consequences physically to subjecting ourselves to sin, which indeed is often harmful to the body itself. Then let's think about this. As we think about some things baptism will not do, let's also realize that baptism will not remove the temptation to sin. And don't get me wrong. Becoming a Christian is an awesome thing. Obeying the gospel and having every past sin forgiven is wonderful, but the moment I, think about this now, the moment I come out of the waters of baptism, is every sin or tempt, is every temptation alleviated? Of course not. Baptism is not going to remove every temptation to sin. It doesn't, you know, sometimes I think, people think, well, baptism is a cure-all, and if I'm baptized, it'll remove, I've lived this way, but if I'm baptized, that'll take care of the problem. No. Baptism is not, is you're going to have help from God. You're going to have help from other Christians. You're going to have the avenue of prayer. You're going to be a child of God. My friend, you still have to resist temptation. Jesus was baptized in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. And the voice from heaven came down. God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. But after His baptism, was every temptation removed? No, in fact, it was actually heightened. Jesus then was taken into the wilderness and was tempted greatly, sorely, by the devil. With everything, the devil threw everything he could at Jesus after his baptism. Baptism didn't remove the temptation. It made him right with God. It gave him an avenue of help. But Jesus still had to resist it. I'll give you another example. What about Simon the sorcerer? Simon, he, he's been a magician, a trickster all his life. He hears the gospel. He realizes it's truth. He obeys that gospel. He's baptized for the remission of his sins. And then Simon, for the very first time in his life, sees a, a bona fide miracle. Somebody's healed. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are given. And momentarily, he reverts back to that lifestyle. Give me, I'll give you money if you can give me this power. Simon found himself in sin. Did being baptized remove that temptation for Simon? No. He still had to learn to resist temptation. And friend, the same is true for every child of God. Is it the case that I still have to resist the devil? Absolutely. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7-9, through 9, Resist him steadfast in the faith, 
knowing that the same temptations have been faced by brethren throughout the world. In fact, listen carefully now. Don't get me wrong. Baptism puts one into Christ. It washes away one's sins. But friend, now that you're a child of God, the battle with Satan is most likely going to intensify. Let me explain. Before, you were a child of the devil. John chapter 8, verse 44. The devil had you right where he wanted you. He had his finger on you. He had you in his group. You were in a lifestyle of sin. You were lost, and that's right where he wanted you. You were under his control. Now you've been severed from Satan by obedience to the gospel. You're no longer a child of his, and I'll assure you, he wants you back. He wants you to be back in His circle. He wants you to do His things. He wants people to be lost and to go to hell. And so the devil is going to intensify. Ephesians 6, 11, everything he can. He's going to throw everything at you he's got. He's going to try to tempt you. He's going to use every tool as an arsenal. He's like a roaring, raging lion. 1 Peter 5, 8, but here's the good news again. You have the power in Christ to resist Him. You have help from God. You have the avenue of prayer. You have other Christians to help hold you accountable and to hold up your arms and strengthen you. But friend, I think sometimes the impression is left. When I become a Christian, every temptation is going to cease to exist. Baptism does not remove the temptation of sin. It's still there. Even though I'm a Christian and I have every right and need to resist it, I still have to do my part in resisting temptation. Realize this as well. Another thing baptism will not do is it will not remove the memory, or what we might better say as, the guilt of sin. When I'm baptized, is my memory of sin erased? Well, of course not. There is still a guilt to sin. 1 Timothy chapter 1, or a memory of it, 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 16, Paul said he was ashamed. After becoming a Christian, Paul said he was still ashamed of his former life in rebellion and disobedience to Christ. Memory of past sins can help us repeat those if we're not careful. I've got to realize, hey, I realize a life of sin. I know I've been forgiven of that. But if I dwell on it and I'm consumed by it, and if I'm not careful, I can be dragged back down into that again. And so what we need is, and sometimes this is the hardest part. Listen carefully now. Does the Bible teach that God has forgiven me of sin if I've obeyed the gospel? Absolutely. Hebrews 8 verse 12, God says this, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. What I need to learn is, if God is willing to forgive and forget, I need to learn to forgive myself and I need to learn to forget as well. Philippians 3 verses 13 and 14, Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the upper prize of God in Christ Jesus. I've got to learn. Hey, am I going to realize there's things I've done? Am I going to be able to forget those? No, but I've got to realize and I've got to learn from them and I've got to learn to forget the things in the past and stay focused on the things that are in the future. And so baptism is not a memory eraser. It's not going to erase the things I've done in my past, although it does forgive me of those. And although I do have the strength now to reach forward, to look up, to if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Now friend, let's realize this as well, because sometimes I think there is confusion on the part of people concerning this. Let's realize that baptism is not going to remove the problems of life. I think sometimes people think to themselves, you know, I've got a lot of problems in my life right now, and, and there's no doubt, people with problems in their life need God. People with problems in their life who've not obeyed the gospel need to obey the gospel, but I think somehow in there a connection is made I need God, I need to obey the gospel. If I'll do that, all my problems will automatically be removed. Friend, don't misunderstand what we're saying. Is God going to give you help to deal with your problems? Absolutely. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken us except such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who with the temptation will also make the way of escape that we can bear it. We can bear it, we can endure it, we can overcome it. Friend, the Bible doesn't teach that baptism is going to magically remove all the problems of life. In fact, the Scripture promises Christians that problems and persecution is going to come. Paul said in Acts 14 verse 22, We must through many tribulations 
enter the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy 3, verses 11 and 12, Paul said, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So, tribulation, persecution, and trouble is promised to come. And some, the Bible says some, because of that, may even fall away. They, ha they don't remain faithful. But here's the good news. God, He's going to give us what we need to endure. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. The Bible teaches, I can find help, I can find wisdom, I can endure through the strength that God gives me. And friend, realize as well, as a child of God, the problems of life can never overcome. They should never overcome, and they should never overshadow the joy of heaven. I want you to listen to this verse, Romans chapter 8, verse number 18. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Are there going to be problems? You bet there are. Am I going to have to face difficulties? There's no doubt I am. Satan's at work. Sin's rampant. Uh, sometimes we do things to ourselves that bring trouble in this life. But friend, heaven is worth it all. Keeping my focus on heaven and on God is going to make things bearable in this life. All right, let me mention another thing baptism will not do in this life. The scripture teaches that baptism doesn't make spiritual growth unnecessary, meaning this, that when I'm baptized, that doesn't mean that I've got to stop trying, and that doesn't mean that I've got to stop growing. In fact, the Scripture teaches when I'm baptized, I need to work diligently. That's the moment that I'm a babe in Christ, and I've got to work diligently to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. 1 Peter 2 verse 2 says to Christians this, but as newborn babes, and no doubt you've got the infantile state of Christianity, one who's just obeyed the gospel and is a babe in Christ, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2 verse 2, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. When I become a Christian, that's the moment I need to be chomping at the bit. That's the moment I need to be excited to grow in Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so just because I've become a Christian doesn't mean I can plop down, close my Bible, and say, well, God's going to do everything now. No, oh, I've got to get up get to work, get busy, do my best to grow spiritually, and try to have the fruit of the Spirit in my life that God wants me to have. Now, friend, I want to address another issue. And this is one that people often confuse as it relates to baptism. What, are, what is one thing baptism will not do along with the others? Please realize baptism will not make an unscriptural state right. Now, let me illustrate it this way. Baptism is not going to make a wrong marriage into a right marriage. Baptism doesn't wash away sinful lifestyles. The Bible teaches, now listen carefully. The Bible teaches that for baptism, we already mentioned this, but the Bible teaches baptism in and of itself, without belief or repentance, it won't do anything. What about a man and a woman who may be in a, a unscriptural marriage. Let's say you've got two people and they're married and they've both been in marriages before and they didn't divorce for scriptural reasons. And so you've got two people who are in a clear unscriptural marriage. Neither one of them has the right to be married to each other. Well, some people will say, if they're not Christians, you can teach them the gospel and baptism's going to wash away that unscriptural marriage. Friend, listen carefully again now. Baptism in and of itself without belief and repentance won't do anything. What about these two people in that unscriptural marriage? Do they have to repent? Do, does anybody have to repent to be baptized? Absolutely they do. They're in an unscriptural marriage. They don't have a right to be in that marriage. They're living in adultery and they're living a life of sin. And before we can teach them about baptism what washes away sins, we've got to tell them you've got to repent of sin. We're living in sin, therefore, we've got to get out of that unscriptural marriage. Now, let me give you the authority for that. Mark 6, verses 17 and 18. 
John the Baptist said to Herod, who had his brother's wife, he said, it's not lawful for you to have her. Why was it not lawful? He was in an unscriptural marriage and he didn't have the right in the sight of God to be married to that person and one must get out of that. From the beginning, Jesus said, divorce was not God's plan. Whoever divorces for reasons other than uh, fornication is living in an unscriptural relationship. And people have got to change their life to get right with God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 11. The Bible says of some living in homosexuality and immorality and ungodliness and adultery and fornication and revelry, such were some of you. What's that mean? They changed their life. Then you were washed, you were sanctified in the blood of Jesus. Now, let me crystallize this in your mind with an illustration. If we're going to say baptism makes an unscriptural marriage right, we really better think about that nowadays. Are we ready to say that if two homosexuals are in a marriage, and we'll recognize that marriage is not scriptural, if two homosexuals are in an unscriptural marriage, are we going to say then if those two people are baptized, they're in a right marriage? Well, of course not. People say, well, that's not a right marriage. Neither is an unscriptural marriage. It's not acceptable. Neither is an unscriptural marriage. It's not recognized in the sight of Neither is an unscriptural marriage. If we're going to say baptism washes away unscriptural marriages, in the day and age in which we live, we better think very carefully about that. Because, friends, we would be led, logically, we would be led to say, if that's true, that baptism washes away the sin of a homosexual marriage and somehow it sanctifies that, which we know is ludicrous according to the Scriptures. And so, friend, as we think about things baptism will not do, let's realize, yes, baptism is essential, but baptism that's preceded by belief, confession, and repentance, that's the baptism that God sees as one that saves a person's soul, but baptism is not going to rid one of every evil or difficulty or temptation in this life, and it cannot make a wrong situation right without repentance occurring first. Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, our hope and encouragement for you today is that you'll become a child of God, that you'll submit to the will of God, and that you'll obey the gospel of Christ. If you've never done that, we're begging you, we're urging you today, become a child of God. Meet the, do what God says to be saved, and if you're willing to do that, then friend, you can be washed of every past sin and the spiritual consequences of that. You can be right with Christ and you can ultimately know, I'm a child of God, I've got the hope of heaven, I now have something every day to look forward to. May God help us each to do exactly what He wants us to do. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.